Hello and welcome to the 5 Minute Film Club. Make sure you grab your blow up aliens and lava lamps and join me in the 1990s for Pierce Brosnan's first outing as James Bond in 1995's GoldenEye. <laughs> A lot has changed in the six years since we last saw 007. The film starts with a flashback to the late 1980s and 00 agents James Bond and Alec Trevelyan are attempting to blow up a Soviet chemical factory. Trevelyan is killed and Bond barely escapes with his life. Jump forward nine years and we meet again with James Bond who seemingly is still struggling with Alec's death and is undergoing psychiatric help. Well, sort of. But he's also in Monte Carlo, looking for members of the Yanis crime syndicate, who he believes is behind the death of Alec. While in Monte Carlo, he witnesses Xenia Onotop, we're back with a Fleming-esque names here, steal a military helicopter. Onotop then uses this helicopter and an electromagnetic pulse weapon, codenamed Goldeneye, to bring down a Serbian satellite. Bond heads out to Serbia at the behest of New M, played by Dame Judi Dench no less, to see whether there are any survivors and to try and understand this new weapon. He then teams up with seemingly the only survivor of the Serbian satellite incident, Natalia Simonova, and the pair wind up in St. Petersburg to meet up with former KGB agent and now gangster Valentin Zukovsky. Zukovsky is then able to set up a meeting between James Bond and Yanis Head Honcho, who actually just turns out to be Alec, who faked his death all those years ago and is now going to use Goldeneye on Britain as revenge for his parents who were Cossacks and sent back to the Soviet Union after World War II. There's a lot of action sequences then, including one involving a tank that is just fantastic and the best seen in a Bond film for such a long time. I mean, the second that tank bursts through that wall and the James Bond music kicks in, uh, it's amazing. Bond and Natalia eventually get to Cuba, where the GoldenEye satellite is hiding, and a big mano a mano fight between Bond and Alec occurs out on the actual satellite dish. After so many years away, and with lots of financial difficulties at the studio, James Bond needed to come back and hit big. But that could have been really difficult, as behind the scenes lots had changed. Not only is this the first Bond since the death of the iconic title creator Morris Binder, here replaced by Daniel Kleinman, it is also the first for a long time that Richard Maybaum wasn't involved in the script, and the first not produced by the main man himself, Cubby Broccoli. He was still around, just not well enough to partake in his usual capacity, so duties fell to his daughter, Barbara Broccoli, and her half-brother, Michael G. Wilson, who'd incidentally wrote a few James Bonds in the past alongside Richard Maybaum and had been helping out Cubby Broccoli for many years as producer. Alongside a new Bond, a new M was also required after Robert Brown's departure. For the first time, they cast a woman, Dame Judi Dench, in the role to mirror real-life head of MI5, Stella Remington. That change means that you can still have the old-school, womanising James Bond, but now you've got somebody to take him to task on it. That relic of the Cold War line that Judi Dench uses in the film couldn't work better, for this is a film that feels so tied back to the early days of James Bond. They always featured James Bond going up against the Soviets, but now the wall has fallen, the old KGB agents have to be a bit more covert. I love that Bond is still trying to fight this war, and that the rest of the world believes it is over. It's one of the great triumphs of this film to take the old Bond formulas and make them feel fresh, and the same can be said for the new man in the role, Pierce Brosnan. If you want to hear the history of how Pierce Brosnan got the role as James Bond, then go back and watch my review of The Living Daylights and License to Kill. But safe to say, getting the role of James Bond was a very long time coming. The story for the film was still being worked on while Timothy Dalton was James Bond, but when he couldn't commit to a further four or five films, he stepped away, leaving Brosnan to take up the reins. I've always thought of Pierce Brosnan as kind of Roger Moore 2.0. Like Roger Moore before him, Pierce Brosnan was a model and an actor. 